and I'm delighted that I've got a friend of the show, Albie Amancona. Now, Albie, of course, you set up Conservatives Against Racism. You're also Conservatives Conservative supporter. Am I barking up the wrong trees? Should I be weeping into my Chardonnay later tonight that Rishi Sunak didn't get the job? No, you shouldn't be weeping into your Chardonnay later on tonight. Although I thought you might be more of a Pinot woman <laughs> rather than a Chardonnay woman, but we'll, we'll just leave that as it is. I share your cautious optimism about Liz Truss. I think she's a very shrewd operator. Look, what a lot of people don't realise about Liz Truss is she's been in the Cabinet, I think, since 2014. I think she's one of the longest serving Which some people cabinet hold ministers. against her because not yes. a lot has been achieved in that time. But... Things like that, a long cabinet sit like that, does not happen by accident. That happens with a real uh, eye for the detail. And that is one of the things that I have been hearing a lot from people that have worked with Liz Truss. One of my friends, Ian Anderson, who was a, until recently the yep. UK's LGBT business champion, was talking about how she is really a woman that is across the detail and that has really strong core principles and drives them through. And I think that should give us all a lot of cause for hope. Yeah, I've been hearing this a lot, that she really does her homework, she really does her research, and she comes to... On things that she instinctively feels you know, are, are part of her her politics, so you know, free markets and so on, she will not be dissuaded from those opinions. But on areas where she doesn't necessarily have the answers, apparently she really, really does her homework, will get good people around her, you know, and they will guide her towards the right answer. And I like that, that, that she's got the hinterland, as I said at the opening, but she is willing to go out and look for answers and perhaps look abroad and say, right, which countries do this better than us? You know, which bits do we do well? And not necessarily listen to the vested interests. She clearly distrusts establishment and vested interests, and so do I. So I like the fact that she's willing to go in and you know, rip things up, as long as she is. You know, we've heard these you know, bonfire of regulations and all these cliches before, and then nothing really happens. Yeah, absolutely. I think it will be good to have a Prime Minister that is across the detail. I would say her one weakness, which I think is a problem for me, which you said isn't a problem for you, is that she isn't a very skilled communicator. And I think that was quite clear from her speech earlier on today. I think she really does need to improve on that, because I'll tell you where that matters at a general election, when she's out there making those free market arguments about policies that can be difficult. On Laura Koonsberg's show yesterday, when she was talking about taxation and how everything shouldn't be viewed through the prism of redistribution, an argument a lot of Conservatives would agree with. I guess the question is, is she the best person to be making those arguments? We really need someone to be making those arguments well. Well, that's an interesting point. And maybe the answer to that is, obviously, she's going to have to do Prime Minister's questions every Wednesday. She's, you know, she's going to have to do a fair amount of press conferences, you know, di diplomatic trips abroad and all the rest of it. But maybe there are better people who can communicate on her behalf in some ways within the cabinet and she can actually do the job, you know, the, the CEO job of actually changing things for the better. I don't know. I, I take your point. And in fact, we will play. Obviously, nobody could be in any doubt as to what her slogan was today. But just in case you didn't catch her speech, uh, listen to this, watch this, and you will know what her slogan was. We intend to deliver. We will deliver. I will deliver. I will deliver. And I will deliver. We all will deliver. We will deliver. We will deliver. We will deliver. We will deliver a great victory. Did you get it? It was deliver. Ten. If you were, you know, if you were doing a drinking game, and if you had to drink when you heard the word deliver, you'd be smashed by now because you would have had to have drunk ten times in her very short speech. It was a very short speech, and I think this is one of the problems with Liz Truss, is what she says is quite often is that she has delivered in all of her roles as a cabinet minister since 2014. But when you actually have a look, it's not terribly clear what she has actually delivered on. Now, she did a great job when she was in the Department of International Trade. I think she delivered, delivered, I've said delivered mm -hmm. already, many different trade deals across the world, signing a new deal with Australia, for example. Um, but when it comes to other cabinet positions she's had, it's not necessarily clear what she's delivered. As Foreign Secretary, OK, she got Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe out of Iran. Congratulations. But other than that... Can you think of something else that she has delivered, Daisy? Well, let's ask the viewers. Can you think of something that Liz Truss has delivered? I'm just going to quickly show you a couple of tomorrow's front pages. We've got the mirror, very striking front page. I'll describe it to our radio listeners. 
You've got David Cameron's face merged into Theresa May's face, merged into Boris Johnson's face, merged into Liz Truss's face. And they say they're same old Tories. Twelve years, Conservative MPs have wrecked the economy, trashed PMs, trashed our public services, left millions worse off, and now we've got another one. So they're not happy. Uh, Metro, Liz, I will deliver. And there she is. Uh, Truss on the front page of the I. Truss plans to freeze energy bills until January. Um, and finally, the FT is in. Truss in a £100 billion energy plan. We will talk about that because, of course, that is the number one thing in her entry. How is she going to help people with the cost of living crisis and the winter that we are all facing? Lots more to talk about after this. Well, as you might know, if you were listening to the top of the show, I have tonight outed myself as something of a Team Truss uh, newbie. I have decided that I'm going to give Liz Truss my backing. I'm sure she'll be incredibly <laughs> happy to hear that. Not that that makes any difference at all, but I've read a lot of interviews that she's given over the years i've listened to some old interviews you know, that, that she's done she did a, a fantastic podcast actually with nick robinson but a really long one like an hour talking about her political journey i hate that cliche but you know what i mean how she came to be the way she thinks now and it it rang true you know she was always quite socially liberal her family, her parents are very, very left-wing. Her mum took her to CND uh, you know, marches. Her, her father apparently is still absolutely horrified um, that she became a Tory, let alone uh, leader of the party. He is He's recently himself been on an anti-Brexit march. But I love the fact that she can be different from the rest of her family, still maintain you know, good family relationships and have respect for them and they have respect for her. That surely is better than having a politician who's just come from a family who always voted in a certain way. It, to me, it shows that she thought about these things. And she said in this interview that she had she'd really joined the Liberal Democrats because that was a bit of a rebellion against her parents. That was as far as she felt she could push it. Um, but she's clearly always been a Eurosceptic, but she didn't vote Brexit. I just think she's she's an interesting person who's quite thoughtful. She's definitely an interesting character. I think what I really like are political journeys. And I like people that can think for themselves and maybe go against the mould a little bit. Yeah. Because ultimately what is needed at the moment in the United Kingdom is someone that can go against the mould in order in order for us to get out of the really sicky situation that we're in currently. You know, we've got the war in Ukraine between Russia. We've got the cost of living crisis happening at home. We've got the housing crisis, which has been going on for years. We've got really slow economic growth, which has been going on since the 2008 financial crash we need someone that is going to go against the grain to help us get out of this rut which we're in and maybe liz truss is that woman yeah we need a rocket put up the country um i'm just gonna have a look at see what you've been saying uh, evening daisy liz truss said today we will have and i quote the ability to control one's own life well she simply must rid the land of wokeness and make free speech an absolute right at all ends of the spectrum else we will all be controlled that's from jim in birmingham thank you very much um, this anonymous tweeter has said, I'm pleased to hear that Daisy is giving Liz Truss a chance. She should be given at least a chance. I feel the same with a praying emoji. I think we're all slightly in that praying mode, aren't we? Please, God, help us. Evening, Daisy. I'm in Team Truss. I agree for reform of the NHS. Scrap the old-fashioned fax machines and BlackBerry pages and go for high-tech equipment. And we'll just have a quick look at some of the other front pages that have just come in. The Daily Mail. Cometh the hour, cometh the woman. No PM since Maggie has faced a tougher in-tray than Liz Truss. Now she plans a shock and awe strategy on energy bills, tax and the NHS to stamp her mark on Britain. Well, I'm all in favour of shock and awe. Daily Express put faith in Truss to deliver for Britain. Uh, the Tory party yesterday put its faith in Liz Truss. And they've got a picture of Liz Truss with her husband, Hugh. Now, it's interesting that... By the time Boris Johnson came to, to number 10, you know, we knew all about Carrie, we knew all, you know, much more about his private life. Liz Truss, although she has a very active Instagram account, which is quite amusing, and again, I think shows her to be much more human than a lot of people think she is. You know, lots of stuff about you know her with cats and her cooking and all the rest of it. She's apparently a very keen cook, as is her husband, Hugh. But really, we know very, very little about him or the two teenage girls who are about to move in to Downing Street, they are 13 and 16. I mean, about the most 
easily embarrassed age of any teenager, hormonal teenager, and they're about to move into Downing Street, and presumably we will see them, unless, because she's, as far as I'm aware, there's never even been a picture of their faces made public. I think the male had a picture of their faces and it was uh, and she got them to take it down some time ago and she's ne she's only ever put photographs of the back of their heads so this is going to be they're called francis and liberty francis is 16 liberty is 13 that's going to be something of a shock to the system i mean imagine being a teenager in number 10 downing street imagine all the mischief that you might get up to if your mum irritated you one day you really could screw things up for her so let's hope well we all remember the blair i mean obviously the blairs <laughs> the blairs had babies in there but they also had teenagers in there and, and everything they did was dissected you know if they got drunk at a party or whatever it might be you know, it was splashed all over the papers but one thing about her principles and being a libertarian she's called her daughter liberty so clearly yeah these libertarian classical liberal principles run through liz truss right the way down to her daughter so she's clearly a very principled woman um, and i think when we when we think about her family you know when she started her political career she almost got deselected because of an affair she had you know yeah. i think there was something called she called them the turnip taliban they called themselves oh, fact, did they? she was talking about this in one of the interviews i was listening to they called themselves with pride the turnip taliban which was quite extraordinary and and she said that she decided to face them she went to see every single one of them individually explained what had happened explained what she stood for and what her, her views you know her, her policies were and what she wanted to do and she won them over so there is definitely a side of her that is more appealing than the soundbite side, but she's she's a long form interview person, and I just wonder if she's going to allow herself to show a bit of that, of that sort of more human personality, or if she's going to do this you know, rather ghastly scripted sound bites which don't suit they suit very few people but they suit her less than most i really hope she does open herself up to the media a little bit more because i think one of the one of the dangers with this trust being a poor communicator is that she ends up being a sort of theresa may 2.0 figure and that is really yeah. the absolute opposite of what the country needs right now and actually to boris johnson's credit he was an excellent communicator, maybe not very good at actually implement, implementing what he was communicating, but he was an excellent uh, human communicator. He, was, he won the, hearts and minds. The problem with him was, is that's kind of all he was. Exactly. Uh, and, and I don't think Boris Johnson or Theresa May or David Cameron really believed in what they were doing. I think they were ambitious middle management politicians i mean you know, boris johnson wasn't middle management he didn't manage anything but he, because he he was very much big picture but it was all about boris's big picture rather than it being a philosophy of a way that he could see you know, the country needed to change and make some real root and branch changes and that's where that's where she is you know, she believes passionately in free market and that the market will will solve things and that government has to be small she believes passionately in devolution and that decisions should be taken closer to the ground and westminster should be as small as possible small government yeah, and those are things that that i believe in and i think are effective and she she was always a eurosceptic but she didn't believe that Brexit. She thought that Brexit, because I'd read many interviews she did at the time, she thought that Brexit was going to be too complicated. Mm -hmm. She thought that Brexit was going to be too messy. She thought that it was going to you know, be trouble. But she was always very anti the way that the EU and the Commission were run and the way that we performed in it. So I think when people say she flip-flopped and suddenly found you know, that she was a Brexiteer having not been a Brexiteer, she was a lot more Eurosceptic than Boris Johnson ever was. Precisely, but just maybe to get off the trust train for a second, just to maybe show the Am other... I turn the into other, a bit of a fan the other, the other opinion <laughs> is, she talks about all of these things, but how many of them are actually deliverable? Yeah. You know, she talks about wanting a smaller government. We're about to go into cost of living crisis, and on the front page of the Financial Times, there are rumours that she's got a £100 billion, 100 billion pound energy plan, plan. That is not small government. Of course, yeah. we've got to be pragmatic and, and tackle the issues of the day. But how many of these principles that she has, of which she has many, are actually going to be deliverable in a two-year period before the next general election? Well, exactly, because as you know, we talk so often on this programme about how, you know, the, the the crime of a lot of 
policy makers is that they've always got an eye on the short term rather than the long term and that's one of the reasons why nothing changes because they're always little rabbits out of hats to win a few votes here and there rather than really fundamental infrastructure you know, or, or changes to the way things are run and in two years you have very little opportunity to make changes that will be felt in people's communities or bank balances um, and as you said the financial times has got this story which is the thing that so we think that quasi Kwarteng is going to be chancellor that seems to be a given he was hinting in the ft a few days ago uh, that he was looking at this huge deal which was in some way prop up the energy business at companies in order that they could bring bills down but this will then involve the government having to to find the money over the years which you know, as the ft is reporting he's quasi quoting is weighing up whether uh, the massive government intervention in the energy market should be uh, should go ahead you know should be paid for by general taxation or through a future levy on consumer bills both of those are very very tricky and neither of them are really what liz trusts what her core beliefs are. No, exactly. And I think one of the things that a lot of the economists that have come out and backed Liz, Tr Liz Truss, whether or not that's Patrick Minford or Gerard Lyons have been, and Julian Jessup, indeed, who have been speaking a lot in the media today, is about actually that, that they felt that austerity was wrong and that during a crisis, actually, we should borrow more to invest in the economy. It sounds mm -hmm. like the opposition's argument. And I would be very interested to see if any of those uh, economists will actually get Liz Truss to come out and say, I think austerity was wrong. When Actually, she was in the cabinet the whole time austerity was being implemented. Yes, no, no, she absolutely was. So the sun has just uh, come out. It's got on the left red alert Meg's back, and that's a, a photograph of uh, Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, who, of course, has been making a speech at the uh, One Young World conference tonight. I was going to feature some of it, but actually it was very bland, so I decided not to bother. So, yes, again, I've I've taken one for the team. Uh, I, I listened to most of the speech and decided that there really wasn't an awful lot for us to get our teeth into, but she looked very pretty. Uh, but Liz Truss, of course, also on the front page of The Sun. Liz puts her foot on the gas. New PM to freeze energy bills. Um, now, of course, there is an argument where she would say, if you freeze energy bills you give people more money to spend on the economy and you, you help the economy in that way. But it's a very tricky one. Daily Star, very good front page. They've got end of an error. Uh, well, that was a bizarre 1,139 day fever dream, wasn't it? And they've got lots of little photographs of uh, Boris pulling silly faces. And then they've got an arrow towards Liz Truss saying, let's hope this one does a bit better as Boris Johnson's chaotic reign came to an end according to the star very important for the conservative party the daily telegraph they've got that picture of liz truss and her husband hugh o'leary uh, trust to outline her vision for office with support for households lasting two years and their headline energy bills to be frozen until the next election and underneath truss urged to make mordant deputy prime minister now that will be very interesting because what she does with some of those other candidates for the leadership i mean we're pretty certain that uh, rishi sunak won't be going into the the new cabinet uh, we're pretty certain as i said that quasi kwateng will be going to number 11 and then tim shipman in the sunday times um, has predicted that james cleverly will be going to the foreign office suella braverman will be going to the home office because of course pretty patel has resigned today to take effect tomorrow i'm guessing uh, she jumped before she was pushed. Cabinet Office, Nadim Zahawi, obviously one of the leadership contenders, but he didn't get very far. Defence, Ben Wallace, also a leadership contender. Um, or did he run? No, no he didn't he run. Was he was a to. member's favourite. That's right. And then he backed Liz Truss in the end. So his backing for Liz Truss was actually seen as quite a big coup. Yeah. And he topped the Conservative home polls, I think, weeks and weeks yes. on end for, you know, the favourite to Very become leader. Very interesting. So he would get defence, which of course is where he is uh, now, so that makes perfect sense. Now health, very interesting. Therese Coffey, she has always been absolutely thick as thieves with Liz Truss. She's been around a long time. She has been in the cabinet before, but she's not in this cabinet, I don't believe. Uh, I think she, she was the, 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 the Secretary of State for Department of Work and Pensions. 
yes. most recently. And actually, I think she's done quite a good job in that department because she's kept it out of the media. There have not been any sort of yeah. scandals to do with benefits under Therese Coffey, which is why I think a lot of commentators thought maybe Liz Truss would keep her in that post because she was doing such a good job of keeping it out of the media. But we know that Liz Truss has said NHS reform is a really big priority you know as we were just saying there's not a lot you can do in two years but you can start the process and she's handed this to Therese Coffey which I mean that will be a huge job a huge job and of course there were actually rumours that she was going to make Therese Coffey the Deputy Prime Minister which is why I'm very interested to see uh, this headline in the Daily Telegraph that Truss is being urged to make more than the Deputy Prime Minister because I think if there's two people that are missing from this list so far it is Kemi Badenoch, who was rumoured for education, and of course Penny Morden, who was rumoured to have turned down the position of party chairman. Um, so I think it will be very interesting to see where Penny Morden falls in this new cabinet because she did garner a lot of support from both the membership and also the MPs. Yeah, obviously no uh, place for Michael Gove. He pretty much announced last week that he's going to the backbenches. Personally, I think that's a, a big loss. I, I think, agree. I think I, it's a huge shame. I think he really was willing to push change through and he didn't he he wasn't one of those cabinet ministers that just wanted to stay out of trouble that just wanted to you know sort of steady the ship a little bit and and, and get through it rather than really you know make some changes make some waves i think he actually actively sought out trouble you know he really was this reforming education secretary who changed the whole gcse system yeah. he was going to be you know maybe the crown in the jewel of boris johnson's leveling up plan um, but none of that came to pass he got sacked just before boris johnson stood down himself so that was a very interesting demise for michael gove and i actually think i don't know whether i've just decided that you know supporting very unpopular people <laughs> is, is a good <laughs> career move but I I actually think that you know, the thing that people most often hold against Michael Gove was when he stabbed Boris Johnson in the back or the front. In the front. In the front, in the, in, the front. In, in, in the front when you know, he was meant to be running his campaign uh, to be leader and then he, he stood against him and said that he's not fit to be leader. With hindsight, I think he was right. I think, I think he had a moment of conscience thinking, I cannot allow this to go ahead, Boris Johnson, for all his appeal... And, and his amazing ability at communication, he's going to run a very bad government, he's going to be out of control, he's not going to tell the truth, he's not going to you know, be a safe pair of hands. And, and I think that Michael Gove knew that when he did that, it would make him incredibly unpopular because nobody likes a turncoat or a traitor. But I do think he thought he was he, it, it was his sort of duty to do it. Well, obviously, he thought it was the right thing to do. Otherwise, he wouldn't have done it at great political cost to himself. I mean, he's never going to be the leader of the Conservative Party. But ultimately, was Michael right or wrong to do that? Well, Boris went on to win that historic majority in 2019. He has made a lot of the big calls right on the vaccine rollout, on the COVID response, on getting Brexit done. We can't forget any of those things. Yes, the past year has been very difficult for Conservatives with, with the Prime Minister's misbehaviour, let's call it. And really, towards the end, it just became untenable, which is why we're in the position that we're in. But I just hope that Michael Gove can really provide some leadership from the back benches, maybe on issues where the government isn't quite getting it right. Maybe he could play a mm. sort of a Steve Baker-esque role uh, in the next administration. Um, so looking down the list of uh, Cabinet Justice, rumoured to be Brandon Lewis, Business, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Trade, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, Leveling Up, Simon Clark, Work and Pensions, Chloe Smith. Obviously, none of these have been confirmed. This is uh, just rumours. Um, environment. Now, this is somebody I don't know. Ranil Jayawardine. Yes, I think there's a slight smelling, spelling mistake. I think it's ah. Ranil Jayawardena. But this is a really interesting MP. He's only 36 years old, so he'd be the youngest member of the cabinet. Makes me feel like I'm not doing quite well <laughs> enough at life. But maybe I'll get <laughs> there one age, day. your age, I'm old enough to have most of their mothers. <laughs> um, so, no, he, he was an early trust backer. And actually, I was quite surprised to see that he was actually given a full-on Secretary of State position. But nonetheless, you know, he was a trust backer and now he's in the cabinet. Which is, I think, one of the things that people people are maybe a little bit concerned about with this cabinet because people have the perception that rather than bringing in, you know, the, the, the people who are big stalwarts in the Conservative Party that will get things done, she's just brought in people that are supporting her, which isn't necessarily always the best way to build this mm. uh, unity that the party so desperately needs to go into the next general election. No, I think that's true. 
Sajid Javid, Northern Ireland. I mean, that seems like a bit of a... I don't know, a nod just to keep him, although it is an incredibly important job at the moment. Especially at the moment. we, You know, the Northern Ireland executive, has, of course, hasn't formed. So it'll be really interesting to see if Sajid Javid, Javid takes this role, what he will do with it. Because I think it's probably actually one of the most difficult jobs in Cabinet at the moment. We've got the Northern Ireland Protocol and all the problems there with the European Union. And I don't think there is a clear vision for what... Uh, the position of Northern Ireland is in, in a post-Brexit Britain. And, of course, it'll be his job to build that vision that the country so desperately needs. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, Nadine Doris has caused a lot of controversy with people saying they can't believe that she would keep her on in that job. Obviously, she was an incredible cheerleader for Boris Johnson. I mean, if you have Nadine's loyalty, it's, you know, she, she would walk over hot coals for somebody who she's loyal to. She would, but is that a good trait in a person? I have to say, I was disappointed to see that Nadine Doris was still in the cabinet. My hope was that we would have a more uh, thoughtful approach to appointing cabinet ministers. Obviously, we don't know if this is yeah. all true. We'll see what happens later on this week. But I do think that for many Conservatives, we really wanted to see someone in that culture role that, that actually wasn't just wasn't just a Liz Truss loyalist, actually someone that was, you know, prepared to make the difficult decisions to make that department a success. It's a difficult department to run. And also, if we look at the, you know, the big offices of state, Prime Minister, Chancellor, Foreign Secretary, Home Secretary, not one white man in those jobs, if we, if the rumours are to be believed, uh, you know, a, a woman of colour, a white woman and two men of colour. I mean, that, that is extraordinary as far as promoting diversity. Absolutely, it is extraordinary. But I guess, Daisy, at what point do we stop putting so much currency on these issues when actually I sort of feel like it's almost become the norm in British politics, which is very different, I think, to many other countries in the world apart from maybe the US and Canada. But much more the norm in the Conservative benches, on the Conservative benches than the Labour benches. Precisely, which is what is very interesting, because, of course, on the Labour benches, you know, they like to think of themselves as the party of ethnic minorities, the party of feminism, the party of gay rights. But which party is it that has delivered the first, you know, the first great officer, great officer of state as an ethnic minority, the Conservative Party, our third female leader. You know, I think the first gay leader of a UK political party was Ruth Davidson, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives. And actually, we've not done that through positive discrimination or anything like that. We've done that through meritocracy and the cream rising to the top. So maybe Labour's got something to learn from us. Now, I'm going to pick you up on lack of positive discrimination because David Cameron did have some all-female shortlists, which personally I approve of, but we will talk about that in a moment. Also, worth bearing in mind that we have a Prime Minister who didn't go to Eton. Well, the time is quarter to 11, and um, Albie Amankona and I were just discussing who might be in the Cabinet, and we were both slightly disappointed to be led to believe by some of the Sunday papers yesterday that Nadine Doris was going to stay at Culture. And I was very pleased to read <laughs> during the break on Twitter that Nadine Doris has just resigned for the Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sports. So perhaps... She Liz was Truss listening. Heard, she was listening to the show and she made a decision based on our conversation. Yes, because let's be honest here. Cabinet ministers don't resign, they're pushed. I mean, they see the writing on the wall or they're told that they're not keeping their job and then they decide uh, to resign. So, in fact... One of the things I wanted from this cabinet was to see Liz Truss being a decisive leader who is looking at the big picture rather than you know, who might suit the parliamentary Conservative Party or who might suit you know, vested interests. And actually, the fact that Prishi Patel and Nadine Doris has gone, I think, is a very good thing. Absolutely. But the question is now, who is going to be the culture secretary? So I think... Penny Mordaunt? I think it could be Penny Mordaunt, but I'd be interested to see whether or not she puts Kemi Badenoch in that role, actually, instead of education. Because Kemi Badenoch was very vocal about not liking the online harms bill and wanting to make some reforms yes. to that in her leadership uh, contest bid. Um, so I'd be very interested to see whether or not Trust puts Kemi into that role so that she can really manage that process in the best way possible. And Kemi's also been very hot on a lot of these cultural issues, which of course, a lot of it emanates from the Department for Culture, Media and Sport.
Yes, it does. So tomorrow will be very, very interesting. We've got uh, Boris Johnson going to formally resign um, and say goodbye to the Queen at Balmoral. Then we've got uh, the, obviously the new uh, leader, new Prime Minister Liz Truss going to Balmoral as well. They're not travelling together, but apparently this is because you don't want to have both of them travelling together. It's not necessarily... It's not secure. Uh, it's not secure to have both the Prime Ministers you know, in, uh, in one place at the same time or on one plane or helicopter or however it is that they're going to be uh, getting there. So I wonder how quickly will we know? I mean, obviously, we can't know her cabinet until she's been officially uh, an appointed the new prime minister and kissing hands there's a lot a lot of disagreement about whether they actually do kiss the monarch's hand because people have been saying to me for the last couple of days they don't do that anymore that that's tradition other people paul burrell said you know, at the end of last week that you know that they did still do it i've read tony blair and gordon brown's memoirs where they've talked about doing it. tony blair definitely did kiss the prime minister's or the, the the monarch's hand but i but was told to sort of brush it rather mm. than put a great big smooch on it so nobody really seems clear on this one no no one does seem clear i've heard different things on this as well i've heard that it's mostly in privy council where they kiss the monarch's hand i mean talking about gordon brown and tony blair this was what 12 and 25 years ago so a lot's changed since then i mean who knows whether or not they kiss the monarch's hands it doesn't really matter. What matters is that Liz Truss is going to be travelling up to Balmoral tomorrow and she will become, the, she, this time tomorrow, she will be the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. On Wednesday, she'll have her first Prime, Minister, Prime Minister's questions with Keir Starmer, which is, of course, one to watch. It'll be interesting to see whether or not Liz Truss's communication skills mm. can, ha can you know, be a good opponent to Keir Starmer, who himself isn't the best communicator. Now, also, they've got a little bit of detail that seems to be coming out um, uh, about her energy package. Also worth noting that uh, both the head of state and the prime minister are both called Elizabeth now. So I that's... actually think Liz Truss's first name is Mary. I sent a tweet about this and I was corrected. So is she Mary Elizabeth? She's Mary Elizabeth Truss. Ah, uh... So, unfortunately, not. We can still claim we can that we've got double, we've dub, got double, double Liz. Liz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Ben Riley Smith, the political um, uh, writer, for, political editor of the Daily Telegraph, has been saying a little bit of intel on that energy package that Albie and I were talking about, the £100 billion, more than furlough. I think furlough was £60 billion. Uh, They are looking at freezing energy bills all the way to 2024 when the next election is expected. Why? Because they think the energy bills are going to stay high right until 2024. Of course, the Labour Party is saying freeze them till 23. Uh, they hope to go big early and not repeat interventions, which I think is wise. I've, I've often said to politics, you know, just go big or go home. You, if, if you're going to make a difference, you don't want endless tinkering, and then particularly with things like benefit schemes and stuff, the more complicated something is, the worse it works, in my opinion. Uh, so Kwasi Kwarteng wrote about helping families through 23 and 24 as in 2023, 2024, they're leaning towards a freeze for all households. That's 28 million households, rather like a section per multiple campaign sources, rather than just a section. Oh, I see. So all households rather than just some households, a bit like furlough, a simple, blunt approach, rather than a more tailored, complicated, bespoke scheme for speed and impact. Again, I would approve of that. A freeze would go way beyond Labour plan, which we've already said, because that would be till 2023. One source says it's a huge intervention. Support for businesses much more complicated than households. One idea per source is effectively freezing bills for the smallest firms. Now, of course, because businesses don't have an energy price cap, and we've, I mean, we've seen it all over social media in the last few days. Some businesses, their energy bills are not quadrupling, I mean, going up but in the 10 tens. times, 10, 20 times. Uh, also says there'll be measures to boost energy supply alongside the bills package. Some in trust camp going cold on COVID-style business loans as many companies are already piled with debt from the pandemic. Ban on fracking to be lifted, coming to effect rapidly. Doesn't need legislation. Regulations also set to be slashed on offshore wind to increase capacity. I mean, that is, that is a lot, because we've all been screaming about the paralysis, zombie government. And obviously, if there had been a government in place, a functioning government, these things could have been put in place a few weeks. But 
better late than never if if they if she has been working on these plans in the last weeks and really is going to hit the ground sprinting as some people are saying well that's good she does need to hit the ground sprinting i think my first thought is it sounds very expensive and also very. for a free marketeer if you were making the free market argument would you be capping prices i mean might 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 you look for something more like cutting the taxes on fuel for people i think 50 percent of petrol or something like that if 50 percent of that tax is 50 percent of the cost of petrol rather is a tax so yeah. maybe we just cut that completely it's not a very free market argument but maybe she's showing her pragmatism so you might get people from the adam smith institute or the iea saying no this is the wrong thing to do but actually you might get people perhaps maybe on the political left that say this is the right thing to do it's actually very similar to what's been going on in in france and also in spain and it's going to be very difficult for the opposition to vote against it I don't think they will vote against no. it because it sounds like it's going much further and wider than the opposition's plan. What I'm actually more interested in, Daisy, is what the support for business will be. It will yeah. be more complicated, but small businesses are the backbone of this economy and that plan isn't quite as uh, well thought out, I don't think, for businesses as it is for families. Yes, and it's and it's clear that the business intervention is going to be much more complicated and you know, as that they seem to be saying they, they would look at smaller businesses, but... You know, where do you draw the line? Is it the number? You know, is it the the wealth of the business, the profits of the business, the number of employees of the business? You can slice that one in many different ways, and there will be businesses who will be very, very unhappy at not being helped. Precisely, and also, how do we pay for it all? I mean, she's ruled out a windfall tax, which is fine, but I think even the most hardened economic liberal like me would say it seems a little bit. Uh, outrageous that we've got energy companies predicted to be making 170 billion pounds over the next couple of years because of this war in Ukraine and the supply demand imbalance um, and it's not really off their own hard work I mean if we are going to implement this huge plan costing hundreds of billions of pounds does it not maybe make sense to implement some sort of wimble tax on those excess profits now we've only got a couple of minutes left but just looking at some of your tweets talking about uh, Nadine Doris could this is from Arthur could Nadine Doris be going to the Lords and David Frost standing in the resulting by-election with the intention of joining the cabinet precisely I mean that's quite a tidy that's basically way a swap exactly <laughs> it's quite a tidy way of solving that by-election problem in her seat I think it's somewhere in the home counties I mean of course there are rumors that maybe they put Boris Johnson in that seat because his seat in South Ryslip at the moment a London seat is marginal whereas yeah. Nadine Doris' seat is a safe seat so if they're going to parachute Lord Frost into that seat I think it would be interesting to see uh, we've just got the Times in a picture of it's not a great picture and it's the one that's on three different front pages um, of Liz Truss she's sort of gurning a little bit but she does look quite happy uh, straight to business is their front um, it's their headline their splash trust plans energy bill freeze amid fear of mass bankruptcies Victor will be appointed Prime Minister by the Queen today of course they mean tomorrow and then underneath Quentin Letts the political sketch writer has said she ignored Sunak and swept past to her destiny it is worth saying that her margin was not that big but you and I Albie we were messaging each other this morning before the announcement and we were both saying that we thought the margin was going to be tighter um, than most people thought you know we both said it was going to be in the 50s and 40s rather than in the you know she wasn't going to get 60 percent or more and and we were right on that I kind of think that doesn't matter no. now. It's that's that's done now. I think what would have been interesting is if the polls were actually more accurate throughout the leadership race, whether or not that 50 40 ratio would have changed things through the leadership election but i think a lot mm. of people thought it was a 70 30 split and liz, liz truss was just going to storm it all the way until yeah. the end she has won i think by 14 percent or something so that is decisive i just wonder whether or not during the campaign had the polling actually been more accurate if that would have changed things for for rishi sunak be because people would have worked out that their vote might not be wasted exactly. if they voted for rishi sunak well, i think i think that's a very good point i do hope that rishi Sunak behaves himself on the back benches. I think he is a very honourable man. I don't think he's going to be bitchy about her sort of carping uh, from the side. I hope that's the case. Um, and I also hope that my newfound faith in Liz Truss is not going to be shattered uh, in the next few days. I will be back this time tomorrow. Have a very good evening and bye bye.